Okay. We are Paul Yotoral and this is our presentation. Our team consists of four members. We have Cleon, who is primary five and is our programmer. Victoria, who is primary six and our builder. Hendrik, who is primary six and is our builder. And myself, Benjamin, who is primary four and our programmer. We will now talk about hardware. We are using, uh, we are using track as it has the most contact area with the ground and can drive over speed bumps and ramps traveling their travels without any problems. At the start, we were using shorter tracks. This was not ideal as they were too small and started kicking. When we tried to stretch them, we changed them. When we tried to stretch them, we changed them to these longer tracks which do not fit. And and added an extra wheel so that they are so that they are not loose. We also had a problem with the tracks to stay in the beginning. To stop this, we added support on the outside. We did not use the wheels as they are were a bit bad as there will be a big gap in between the wheels and the bottom of the robot. We'll hit the speed bounds. We will need to use the gears which are bouncy and complex to use. Also, the robot has a low center of gravity and will not hover on the speed bounds and ramps when the when the robot is seated. This is but this is done by making the heavy industry as good as possible. One problem that prevents you to have Team face was that the robot collided with the walls. To improve this, we made the robot as far as possible. Now we'll be talking about the forward facing color sensor. As you can see from the picture above, there is a forward facing color sensor to detect the rescue kit and obstacles on the line and the dead or alive victims in the evacuation zone. One of the considerations was to make sure that the height of the color sensor gets to be smaller than the smallest object, which is the GCM cube. Also, since the sensor can only be checked directly in front of it, and the cube and balls may, have, may be off to the side, we made sure that the ball was started, so that the items to be selected will move in front of the sensor as the robot was very slow. Initially, we also wanted to detect the evaluation point of the front color sensor. However, we realized that we could not easily differentiate between the evaluation point, which is black, and the air, so we used the ultrasound sensor for that input, which we will talk about later. Next, we'll be talking about the ground facing color sensors. There are two ground facing color sensors that place the ground for land traffic and use for detecting. One of the things we have to note when mounting these color sensors is making sure that the sensors are one thing above the ground, clear the speed bar, and maintain the reading. Another consideration is to make sure that the distance between them must be equal to the distance between the two green squares. We will now talk about the ultrasound sensor. The ultrasound sensor is placed on the side of this robot and is used to track a lot of obstacles in the and also to track the walls in the evacuation zone and detect the heat in the evacuation point. Since we do not know the size of the object on the line, we keep a fixed distance from the object and continue moving until the robot sees the line again. The ultrasound is able to measure the distance. We use the same code to track the walls of the evacuation zone. This is because our robot was slanting in the beginning and could not do the evacuation so reliably. At first, we thought that if the ultrasound sensor was anywhere below 15 cm, which is the minimum height of the obstacle, then it will sense the objects. But we also needed to detect the evacuation point. So we did sensor it down to sense the evacuation point, which is 6 cm tall. Next, we will be talking about the grip and leaf mechanisms. We need this as there are two types of objects. The level 2 cube and the victims, which needs to be transported to the evacuation point and lifted above the 6 cm barrier. Since we are using EV3, which only have 4 motor pods, we have to use a grab and lift, which can, which can do 2 actions with 1 motor. To design the grab and lift, we need we got everyone to build one of their own and choose the best design. In the end, we realized that the best design had to include rubber pieces to have enough friction to group both of the objects. Also, since the grab and lift was lifting before grabbing at the start, this meant that the claw was too light. To solve this problem, we added two ball bearings and added more weight to the claw. The grab and lift mechanism explained by them will put the objects on the platform so that they can be sorted. The sorting mechanism placed on top of the robot will sort the white balls or the rest of the to one side of the sorting channel and the black balls onto the other side. This is so that we can first deposit the live victims, then the dead victims, so that we can get the maximum points. 
Next, we'll be talking about the second mm -hmm. chapter, storage channels. There are two channels, one for the dead victims and the other for the alive victims along the blue cube. When building, we had to make sure that the channel was floating down and was built for both cubes and victims. The channels connected to that. Next, I will be talking about the tree bus. These are a few parts of the considerations we have when we the tree bus. We have to make sure that the length of the trigger was 6 cm or more. But at the same time, we have to make sure that the trigger was short enough so that we would not get caught when depositing the blue tool and the rust in the victims. Lastly, we made a trigger such that the alive or dead victims will slide down the solid each channel. We will now talk about programming. The main task for this challenge is wine tapping, which I will talk about. What we did was to calibrate the sensor value from 0 to 1. When the color sensors see the same color, they would give different values. Before we did calibration, the robot could not cross the line gap because the robot would turn. How did we do this? First, we went to the field and got the red, green, and blue values of white, which is the maximum value, and black, which is the minimum value. When taking the sensor value, we subtract the minimum value from the current value. The robot was moving. After that, we took the current values and divided it by the maximum value minus the minimum value. The final calibrate, calibrated value would be between 1 and 0. This allowed the robot to cross the gap. For proportional tracking, the left color sensor minus the right color sensor value tells us how far the robot is from the line. The further the robot is, the faster we turn until the value side. When they are equal, the robot moves straight. We adjusted the maximum turning speed, which happens when the robot is furthest from the line, so that the robot can cross the short lens. Next, we will be talking about the green square. We managed to detect the green square by using error, which is the difference between the current value and the green square value. We, 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 we added the red, green, and blue error to find the error. Then we will also see the line and then on the other until the robot detects black. The direction, the direction of the green, the direction that it turns depends on the direction of the green squares. It will continue and move more green squares above the top. Now we'll talk about blue tube detection. We got percentage blue divided, dividing blue with RGB. When we detected the blue cube, we open the cross, we move forward, and push the cubes toward forwards to make sure the distance between the cube and the sensor is constant. We do the same thing with the red line using percentage red. We need to detect the silver strip to start in better recent wrong code. Since the silver strip is more effective, we can detect it by checking the red, green, and blue values that the robot is detecting that the robot is using is higher than the values for hot. The white values are already stored in the lens which we are using for calibration from here. For the evacuation zone, we use the same watch that we use for moving around the obstacle. This allows us to move straight. While wall tracking, we are also checking the middle color sensor. If there is no ball detector, the sensor will sense zero. If something is detected, we move closer to the to make sure that the distance between the ball and the filter is consistent. This is also what we are using for the blue field. If the black ball is detected, we sort it into the empty storage. If the silver ball is detected, we sort it with the blue tube. To do this, the black and the mechanism deposits the field on the platform and the sorting mechanism knocks it to one side. When the robot reaches 30 cm from the wall, we move to where the evaporation point is supposed to be. If it is there, the other sound will get a low reading. We then deposit the balls of Cube. If it's not there, the robot will return to where it stops, wall tracking, and continue. The robot is also able to track when there's an opening in the wall. We do this by moving forward when the ultrasound receives a high value instead of turning. This also allows us to detect the factor. In the future, we plan to spiral to the middle of the back so that we can pick up more balls. We do this by tracking further and further from the walls. This brings us to the end of the presentation.